A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. As Wendy Adelson sits in the police station... ...to be here and helping with the kids. Um, and so for my information, what are your parents' names? She gives a rundown of her family members. My parents' names are Donna and Harvey Adelson. And did you say they're in Florida? They are. They're, um, they're sort of in the process of retiring. Uh, maybe semi. Um, mm-hmm. So they work together. They're super happy and in love. Then there's a brother. The one his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to. Charlie's the middle child. But Wendy has another brother. Yeah, so I'm the oldest, and then my brother behind me, and then I'm six years older than Wendy. Rob Adelson. Rob's in his mid-40s. He's a physician. And he's the only one of his immediate family that doesn't live in Florida. In part, that's because of something that happened more than a decade ago. At the time, Rob was doing his internship in Texas. He met someone and fell for her hard. But there was a problem. After maybe about eight or nine months, uh, he said he had something to tell me, that we had to talk, and I didn't really know what it was going to be. The problem was Donna and Harvey. And basically, he said that his parents just couldn't, uh, couldn't accept him being someone who wasn't Jewish and that he'd have to break up with me, that they literally said it's either her or them. It was that simple. Haritha was not Jewish. Huh, okay. And was that explicit? Yes. Rob was stuck between the woman he loved and his family. And so began a painful series of breakups and reconciliations. He was very close with his parents at the time. So so we proceeded to break up and get back together and break up and get back together over the course of another year and a half. For someone like me who, you know, I was extremely, probably overly close to my parents, pleasing them, you know, mattered a lot. All of this was happening at the worst possible time for Rob. He was in his residency, which is a notoriously draining, stressful process. Finally, his parents wore him down. He broke up with Haritha. And, well, he doesn't like to talk about what happened next. Had my parents not put up multiple years of uh, uh, threatening to disown me, um, multiple years of uh, angry, difficult phone calls, it never would have occurred. He actually got engaged to someone else, a nice Jewish girl from Dallas. His parents were much happier with that relationship. But it didn't last. I was very briefly married to someone else. I feel terrible for uh, all the pain it caused anyone involved. Days into the marriage, Rob decided he'd made a huge mistake. There was a rapid, I believe, annulment. Haritha took him back, and they got married. And Donna and Harvey, well, they were at the wedding. They came around and told Rob, you know, we've decided that it would be okay for you to to be with with her. And for, they really tried, we all tried for a fresh start. But making that fresh start wasn't easy. Rob says breaking up with Haritha and marrying someone else even briefly because of his parents is the worst thing he's ever done. I do think my parents did everything they could do to try to make things better. Uh, there, there's a good bit of uh, scar tissue to wade through from that. I don't think it's, I don't think it resolved, but I think it made it better. But before you were, you counted yourself as really close with your parents. Yes. And after, would you still say the same thing? Less so. Still, Rob and Haritha kept coming to family events, and they stayed in touch with both Dan and Wendy even through their divorce. Then they heard the news about Dan's murder and their stomachs turned. Here's a question for you. Don't, don't, uh, did you think you knew what happened? You know, I, yes, and I was also hoping that it, it would not be a worst case scenario. From Wondery, I'm Matthew Scher, and this is Over My Dead Body. 
Baby, I'm guilty I've got his blood on my hand Baby, you're crazy I never touch that hand The first season is called Tally, and this is episode three. Who would do this? Tallahassee police now scrambling to unravel the riddle of who killed Florida State University professor Dan Markell. Markell's ex-wife, a fellow FSU professor, Wendy Jill Adelson, said through a lawyer that she is just devastated and scared to death. Dan Markell was shot around 11 a.m. on July 18th, 2014, a Friday. By the next Monday, his death was national news. It was on CNN, on the headline news network, on Good Morning America. His face was in the pages of the New York Times, and now not for a wedding announcement. Police seek clues in fatal shooting widely known criminal law professor in Florida. This is my desk. If there's ever a fire that's gonna start in the newsroom, it's gonna be all these court documents on top of the power strip here. But Carl Edders, a crime reporter at the local paper, the Tallahassee Democrat, had the jump on the outside journalists. See, Edders grew up in Tallahassee, went to high school in Tallahassee, went to college in Tallahassee. He's covered his hometown for years. His desk is overflowing with paper, documents related to the biggest cases of his career. So yeah, this is kind of where the magic happens. Robberies, shootings, college hazing incidents. I have my Dan Markell clips right here. I like look at this when I turn around every day, pretty much. Like I said, this is the this is probably the biggest story I'll ever work on. It's probably the biggest story in Tallahassee ever, I would say. On the day Dan was shot, Carl was actually off work. I remember my phone dinging with an update from our newspaper that uh, investigators were working on a shooting over on Trescott Drive. Right away, it was clear this investigation wasn't going to be typical. You know, you have a very well-to-do law professor, well-known lawyer killed in an upscale neighborhood with very little leads being released. Especially for a small city like Tallahassee. Sleepy southern town, I would say. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that it's actually the capital, you know, and that's, that's a really good way to describe it. I mean... Carl and his colleagues had sources all over the place. Folks on the police force, locals in town. In Tallahassee being so small, people notice when the crime scene investigators are out. Still, there was too much story here for just one reporter to handle. The paper put a team together who built a solid timeline of Dan's actions on the day of his death. Dan's day starts a little before 9 a.m. when he leaves his home in Benton Hills in his Honda Accord and drops off his two sons at their daycare. He says goodbye to his kids. He gets back on the freeway. FSU students are gone for the summer, so he has no classes to teach. It's Friday, the weekend's coming. And the heat, which would hit a stifling 94 degrees later on in the day, is manageable right now. Cooler, with mostly clear skies. Dan heads to his gym. He works out there for a little over an hour. And at 10.38 a.m., he gets back in his car to head home. On the way, he rings up Stuart Slazer, a local teacher. Dan's calling, Slazer would later tell the police, because he just found out Wendy's trying to enroll the boys at a new school without telling him. And so I'm like, okay, this isn't, you know, I don't want to get in the middle of this, but it's, it's a good school, blah, blah, blah. And now, of course, Dan wants to be involved in the decision. He's doing his due diligence. We started talking, didn't really get to the heart of anything. And he said, hold on a second. There's someone in my driveway that's unfamiliar to me. And I'm pretty sure that's the words he used. And I said, sure, no problem. Good. It was a loud sound, which sounded either like a grunt or something. It sounded like a person making the sound, but it didn't sound like a good sound. Dan is shot twice at close range with a handgun. One bullet enters his forehead and the other his cheek. An injury on his forearm suggests he put up his arm to try to protect himself. Glass goes everywhere. The window is shattered, and Dan's black frame glasses fall to the floor of the Accord. The lens is broken. The killer vanishes, pulls out of the driveway, 
and is gone. The keys are still in the ignition in the car sitting in his garage. This one doesn't fit any of the usual molds. At first, the reporters are thinking, robbery. We didn't know that no one had entered the house at the time, so um, after we found that out, obviously it's not looking like a robbery. It doesn't look like anything is missing. The day of the shooting, the police continue to walk through all the possibilities with Wendy. For eight hours, they talk about all the people who might have had something against Daniel Markell. He goes by Danny. Danny, okay. No one calls him Daniel. That's, I don't know him, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just telling okay, you Danny. so that it just feels really impersonal. The talk turns to the last time Wendy saw her ex. Wednesday, I picked up the kids and I was going to take them to Whole Foods. Okay. And I saw Danny working on his computer in the window of the Whole Foods and I took him to Burger Fi instead. Oh. Because he and I were, you know, divorced right. and interactions with him were hard. And it was my one day with the kids and I thought, well, if we go inside, it's going to be like all of us together and I wanted time by myself That's fine. with them. Not surprising. She and Dan haven't been on good terms for a while. He never hurt me physically, but he was he was emotionally abusive. Okay. And I didn't tell most people that, so all most people know is we it just didn't work out, and it's just the kids are young, and this is just better this way. She considers the possibility he committed suicide. I mean, I can see him being really sad when we first got divorced. Right. But now he's got Amy, and he loves those boys. Okay. Amy's Dan's current girlfriend. And things were really good for him. There's. No way he did this to himself. But Amy, she's got an ex-husband. Maybe, Wendy says, he's involved somehow? If you're gonna think of someone who's not thrilled with Danny, I don't know how happy her husband or ex-husband is with the situation. Or someone else who might have something over him. He doesn't gamble, he doesn't drink, like he doesn't have any vices, he doesn't right. do anything weird. In the hours and days right after Dan's murder, there were a million theories floated about what could have happened. David Latt, he documented some of these theories on his blog. In the early, early hours, people even thought it could have been some kind of burglary or robbery attempt gone awry. The police were so stumped, they reached out for help. Tallahassee police now say they're short on clues and have opened a dedicated tip line, hoping to provide the kind of justice Markell sought for others. And they got some interesting leads. Like from the law school. What if the killer is a former student who hated Dan? Danny can be crass, and I can see how he can come across as condescending. He would rub people the wrong way because he was very, he very high pollutant, he used thick words, he was very confident in his intelligence, but it came across as arrogant. Okay. He came across as arrogant to many people. And then there's the tip from a guy named Willie Hill, who one day walks into the station house with some first-hand information. The morning of the murder, Willie had been on Trescott Drive and had seen a guy in a red truck absolutely screaming down the road. Hair was like you, your color. Okay. Uh, it was a white guy. White male? Uh-huh. Anything else that you remember about him? Well, it's just a look on his face like he was mad at the world, you know. He looked like he wanted to kill somebody. Which way was he driving? The detectives ask. Hill doesn't hesitate. He was heading toward that house. So maybe, somewhere between the gym where he was working out and his house, Dan cut someone off. Maybe the person he cut off followed him back to Benton Hills and shot him. Maybe. But road rage or a disgruntled student, those don't quite fit. This killing seems planned, targeted. Like it's someone who has a grudge against Dan. It was very, very professional. Through the window, nothing left at the scene. No one touched anything. It was just sort of an in and out sort of thing. It was a very clean homicide. People wondered whether perhaps uh, the murder could have been related to uh, some consulting work he was doing on a uh, controversial case involving some rabbis and a uh, Jewish divorce. Yeah. Maybe it had something to do with a rabbi in New York. A rabbi known as the Prod Father. (laughs) 
The first time I ever heard the name Dan Markell was in 2014. I had been assigned to cover a strange court case involving some Orthodox rabbis in New York. It was another story that involved some pretty unhappy marriages. See, in certain strains of Orthodox and Hasidic Judaism, the man has all the control over when a marriage ends. And unless he consents to sign a kind of permission slip called a get, G-E-T, his wife is trapped. She becomes an aguna, a chained woman. The rabbi at the center of the case I was covering was named Mendel Epstein. He provided women in this situation with a very specific kind of service. Epstein talked about forcing compliance through the use of tough guys who utilize electric cattle prods, karate, handcuffs, and place plastic bags over the heads of the husbands. And surprise, surprise, it worked. Epstein always managed to get what he needed. His catchphrase was a divorce or a funeral. And he earned a nickname too, the prod father. In 2014, an FBI sting brought Epstein down, along with his deputy, a rabbi named Martin Walmark. Two rabbis are in jail this morning. They're accused in a kidnapping and torture plot. The targets, men who refuse to divorce their wives. As the two rabbis assembled their legal defenses, Walmark, the Proud Father's deputy, brought on Dan Markell as a legal consultant. My article was published. And then, that December, I opened my email to find an unusual message. It was from a friend of Dan's, and he had a theory. Okay, what if, the email said, Dan had been shot for advising the deputy rabbi to flip on the prod father in exchange for a lighter sentence? Sure, why not? I mean, it seemed as plausible as anything else. I emailed him back to say I'd do a little digging. All right, Mr. Latasso, I appreciate you coming in and talking with me here. In the meantime, another person had caught the eye of police. Jeff Lacasse, Wendy's boyfriend. Like I said, uh, we're, we're still in the preliminary stages of this investigation. Yeah. Uh, your name did come up of course. Uh, because you were associated at some point with Wendy, of course. which is his ex-wife, as I'm sure yeah. you know. Yeah. The Tallahassee police would end up calling Lacasse in for two long interviews. The first one is three days after Dan's death. You met Wendy? Not personally. Yeah. Uh, very charismatic and uh, very good at... Uh, I mean, once you date this way, it's too anything for I'm not the only man that's been under her thumb in that way. I mean, she really has this charisma and this sexuality. And so, you know, you throw yourself in front of a bus for this girl. It's just a new kind of thing for me. Lacasse has an alibi for the day of the murder. He says he was on his way to visit friends in Tennessee. And you said you stopped in the suburb of Atlanta? Where was that? I can't remember. I stayed at a really crappy day's end, maybe 20 miles south of Atlanta. 20 miles south of Atlanta? Yeah. I could pull up a credit card receipt through I need to know. Later, the police tell the cast, hey, we're on the outside looking in. We're searching for any information that might help crack the case. Lacasse thinks about it. Her brother is an unusual guy. He's not talking about her brother, Rob. He's talking about Wendy's other brother, Charlie, the one who followed his dad into the family business. He's a dentist and he's very wealthy. He kind of hangs out with people from both sides of the tracks. And, uh, you know, he goes podium in South Beach with his rich buddies, and he also goes to his gym with some other kinds of characters kind of thing. So, some less savory individuals? I think so. But Lacasse has only met Charlie once. He's really only going off secondhand knowledge. When the cops ask Wendy about how her family feels about Dan, she doesn't mince words. My parents are you know, very angry towards him. Um, but even when they're around my kids, they would never say a bad word about my kid's sure. father. They're right. really, really careful about that. They just like him, but they know he's the father of my kids. They would never, they would never do that. Right. I don't know who would be angry enough with him. Well, that's what I have to find out. To do something like this. Is it even possible her family would ever do something like this? The investigator asks. No, Wendy says. I made my brother, um, the one his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to, he makes a lot of jokes in bad taste, and it was a joke he made. He bought the TV for me this morning that 
got broken and I was talking to him about whether it made sense to pay to fix it or whether I should get a new one and it was always his joke that like he knew Danny treated me badly and it was always his joke. He said, I, I, you know, I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV. So oh. instead I got you this TV. Okay. Um, I mean, he would never, <laughs> he's my big brother and he's been taking care of me since I was little, but he would never. And I, I said, I told that to the repair guy this morning. Right. It's okay. I said he asked me how much it cost, and I said I didn't know because it was a gift. Because my brother said it was cheaper than a hitman. It was my divorce present. Okay. It's such a horrible thing to say. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> but even my family, who felt like I had been mistreated, would never do something like this. Never. The police ask Wendy if they can look through her phone and she hands it over willingly, joking that she's grateful she hadn't made any embarrassing calls that morning. She runs through her day with them over and over again. The TV repair, running errands, a lunch date with friends, which is where the police found her. Somebody tried to kill my ex-husband. They should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Regardless of who it is. I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother, but I don't think it was my family. Uh, anyone outside my immediate family, that's a tough one. Okay. But I don't think my immediate family did this, so... Okay. If it's anybody else, yeah. Okay. Would, would do you think that this guy, Charlie, would even be capable of doing something like this? No. He's a joker. But others, like David Latt and Carl Edders, weren't so sure Wendy and her family didn't have anything to do with Dan's murder. I knew from the last phone conversation that I had had with Dan that he had a rather acrimonious divorce from his wife, Wendy. In Latt's very first blog post about the killing, he's got almost no information besides the initial police reports. But he goes there. My mentioning the possibility that Dan's divorce could be related to Dan's murder uh, was not well received. I got a lot of angry email from people connected to Dan's ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, and the Adelson family. Uh, saying that uh, my theory was outlandish, absurd, and offensive. Uh, so my even mentioning these events in the same paragraph uh, did not sit well with people. You look at uh, some of the assets she was trying to get a hold of and the custody battle, and that's a natural motive to look at anyhow. You know, we're, we're looking at those things and, you know, you're going, hmm, maybe. You and know, kids. And kids, you know, people people will do lots of things for their kids, I think. And I think that's a natural way to think about it when you read. It was all there on paper. It's all in the court filings. And you look at that and you say, well, yeah, that could be it. During her interview with police, Wendy asks to get her phone back so she can call her parents. They'll want to know about Dan. Okay, here it goes. This is, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> Hi, Mom. How's it going? Mom, I need you to sit down. I am fine. The boys are fine. Um, I need you to sit down. Danny has been... Da um, Danny has been shot. Um, and I don't think he's going to make it. I really need you to come here and be with me. Okay, but be careful, okay? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, love you too. Bye. Wendy arranges for a friend to pick up her boys. She doesn't want it to be a police car getting them at school. The police and a victim advocate talk to Wendy for about another hour, and then she heads home. It will be the last time Wendy ever speaks with the Tallahassee police directly, instead of through an attorney. Music 
As the Tallahassee police are talking to eyewitnesses, persons of interest, fielding tips from the hotline, they're also pulling videos from the closed circuit cameras that caught Dan's movements that day. And it's here that they get their first big lead. When they look at the footage from the cameras outside Dan's gym, they see that when Dan's Accord left the lot that morning, another car was following him. They start looking at other footage from city buses and other buildings, and they confirm that, yep, everywhere Dan goes, there's that same car. The car has been tailing him all morning. The Tallahassee Police Department has two updates in the investigation. The first one is going to be the suspect vehicle, and this is a picture of the actual suspect vehicle. They released that they had a car of interest, which was a silver pine mica Prius um, that was seen leaving the, the house. The murderer must be in this car. But the windows are tinted. And in the video footage from Tallahassee, the angles are wrong. Police can't see the license plate number. Still, they do have a few other clues about the car and where it might have come from. There was a few things about the car that really stuck out. There was a tow hook on the front that was missing. Uh, one of the mirrors was an after factory mirror, so it wasn't the same color. And there was a SunPass transponder in the window. And that's down in central Florida on the turnpike. There's toll booths and you get one of those so you don't have to, you know, break out the change jar every time you go through a toll. It just scans it as you go down. But it's not enough information to identify the driver. The investigation seems to slow to a crawl. The police increase the reward to $100,000 for any information that leads to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible. The news vans go home. Carl Edders and his colleagues at the local paper move on to other cases, other stories. There was a lot of frustration. We would revisit it from time to time. The police department would, you know, every once in a while, you know, put out videos or, or release what evidence they'd had, or, or, and especially about the car, they've honed in on the car a lot. After a year, still few clues in Dan Markell killing is the headline of a story the Tallahassee Democrat runs on the anniversary of the murder. Just about the biggest news in it is that the house on Trescott's been put on the market. I think a lot of us thought that I don't know if they're ever going to solve this murder just because of how clean it was, how little there was in the way of suspects and information that we were getting. I think a lot I did, and I know a lot of people here in the newsroom definitely felt like this, this case may never be solved. After that email I got about Dan Markell and the Prod Father, I started keeping tabs on the case too. I read what I could about it. I made some calls to people I'd spoken to for my story about the Orthodox rabbis, but no connection turned up between Rabbi Epstein and Markel's murder. After leaving Tallahassee, Wendy stays with her parents for about a year, then moves into a two-bedroom apartment in Miami Beach with her two boys. The neighborhood is trendy, the kind of place where Russian oligarchs buy fourth or fifth or twelfth real estate properties. But Wendy's complex is actually pretty family-friendly. She seems to her neighbors like a woman who's got it all. Two cute kids, plus a prestigious job clerking for a federal judge. Dan's parents, Ruth and Phil, would come down to see the kids. I had a tradition of going to Florida, Miami area, several times a year. And I would always tell uh, Wendy that I'm coming and we would have a plan and we'd give out the dates and she would tell me what worked or what didn't work. So I went with Wendy and the boys to the circus, and we enjoyed it. And Wendy's family are always around. Hey, Charlie. Hey, how are you? Good. Good to hear your voice. How's my boy? Donna, Harvey, and Charlie all live close by. Good, good. Just finished a long day. We are at Wendy's house, just returning the boys. Donna often watches the boys during the weekdays while Wendy's at work. You can never hide anything in front of the no. you know, Once they have a mouth, they open it up and they tell you everything. You know? Yeah. No, that's, that's great. And listen, Wendy just doesn't comprehend how lucky she is. No, she doesn't. It doesn't, like, register in her head how lucky she is at all. On the weekends, the Adelson clan, Wendy, the boys, Grandma and Grandpa, Uncle Charlie, sometimes hang out at the complex pool. Some of Wendy's neighbors get to know her, and they do wonder, why is this beautiful, charming mother of two single? Then they Google her. 
The first two years, there was really nothing available. They had nothing to tell us. They didn't know anything. And we're sitting here in Toronto and wondering, you know, is this anything is ever, ever going to come of this? We had continuous communication. We didn't have information. Yeah, two years passed and nothing happened. I said, but this is a bunch of inept, blah, 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 the TPD, the Tahasa Police Department. They don't know anything. Just bring the FBI. I don't know. And then... In 2016. When arrests were made in the Dan Markell case, uh, I was in many ways relieved because the case had been somewhat cold. It was about 12.30 at night, and I don't normally stay up that late, but I was up and I got an email that an arrest had been made in the Dan Markell case. While most people thought that the trail had gone cold, the Tallahassee police had been busily putting together who was inside that silver pine Prius. First, by looking at video footage from around town. Then, by pulling all the cell phone information from the area, what's known in law enforcement as a tower dump. What did that lead you to? Initially led us to a phone number that was identified as being used by Sigfredo Garcia. Sigfredo Garcia a 34-year-old man from Miami. Sigfredo Garcia's phone, in turn, led them to a man named Luis Rivera, who was listed in Garcia's phone contacts. And when police ran Rivera's number... We found the phone number belonging to this subject was also in the area of Markel's home on the day before the homicide. Detectives knew the Prius had a Sun Pass transponder in the windshield. So they put in a request with the Florida Department of Transportation. Type of um, transponder activity that took place between Naples and Broward County across Alligator Alley, which is I-75. And there was only one registered vehicle through Sun Pass that made those transponder activities at the approximate times I gave them which traced the Prius back to a rental car company near Miami. An investigator dropped by and found a receipt. They provided to him showing that Luis Rivera rented this car, rented it before the homicide, returned it after the homicide. Carl Edders, from the local paper, gets an email blast from the Tallahassee Police Department. So it says the Tallahassee Police Department has made an arrest in the Dan Markell case. We've arrested Sufredo Garcia in Hollandale Beach. I know a little bit about South Florida. I don't know, I have to look up where Hollandale Beach is. But why would he travel from Miami to Tallahassee to commit this crime? His girlfriend, Katie Magbanawa, says he's being set up. This is why cops plant things on you. It says that's just something so that they could say that first, because I've been hearing in the news and they say that, and then they're making it seem like he's a horrible person and then they put that freaking thing and then it's like, I can't. But it quickly becomes clear that there are even more people involved. You were supposed to bin leave, Katie. When I told you, bin leave, Katie, somebody else fucking knows something because this shit would have not came out unless he told someone else. That's why I can't even talk to nothing, But there's nothing. I don't know what the hell's been going on. I've been separated with him. There's nothing on him. He wouldn't never do anything like this, ever. You know him. I need to talk to you. Where are you? That's on the next episode of Over My Dead Body. From Wondery, this is part three of six of Over My Dead Body, a story about marriage, divorce, and revenge. Over My Dead Body was written and reported by me, Matthew Scher, and Eric Benson. Sound design by Jeff Schmidt. Associate producer is Chris Siegel. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery.